Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the actually seventh Cliff Grads uh, virtual uh, the student session on ruminant systems. Thanks everyone for joining us again. By this point you all are quite aware of the purpose of each of these sessions. Um, so this one here is specifically for the round three Cliff grad students to be able to collaborate with one another on ruminant systems. And we have our chair, Dr. Sinead Leahe of the New Zealand Agricultural and Greenhouse Gas Research Centre, or NZAGRC, and she has extensive experience in ruminant systems and ruminant microbiology and um, will be able to tell us a little bit about her background and her role at the NZADRC. So we have um, a couple of notes for housekeeping. With this session, it's set up as a meeting, so each of you will actually be able to unmute and ask a question if you have a question for one of the student presentations or for Sinead herself. Um, please feel free to do that, otherwise you can raise your hand and um, one of us, either Sinead or myself, will unmute you so that you can ask the question. Otherwise, if your internet connection won't allow you to do that, please feel free to record your question in the chat box and we'll keep an eye on that and we can ask one of those questions to either one of the students or to Sinead or to any of the other senior researchers on the call. Um, so yeah, we have five students today and yeah, we'll start off, Sinead, I'll hand over to you and you can introduce yourself and your role. Okay, thank you, Hazel. I'll try and share, once you've stopped sharing, I'll try and share my screen. Okay, I think it says you need to make me a host. Um, oh, no, I've got it, hold on, let's go. See. Yeah, that looks good, Sinead. Yeah, um, you can see the, the gallery isn't on screen. No, it's just my PowerPoint presentation, Hazel, yeah. Yes, great. Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening everyone. Um, it's a really great pleasure um, to be here and helping to facilitate this session alongside um, Hazel from the GRA Secretariat. As Hazel mentioned, my name is uh, Dr. Sinead Leahy. I'm from the New Zealand Agricultural Greenhouse Gas Research Centre. That's a little picture of what the research centre looks like. We are predominantly a funder of research in the agricultural greenhouse gas research space, but we also um, help lead uh, New Zealand's science input into the Global Research Alliance on behalf of the New Zealand um, government. Um, I myself am a rumen microbiologist and what I've given away my age has spent well over a decade um, researching these fascinating uh, microbes that live in the gastrointestinal tract of um, ruminants. And my research has really been focused on really getting the underpinning science around rumen microbiology that's going to be needed for development of technologies that might help to mitigate uh, particularly methane emissions from ruminant um, animals. The GRA Secretariat asked me if I could put together a few slides um, just to sort of help set the scene for the presentations that we're going to hear um, um, today. So without further ado, we'll, we'll get um, um, stuck in. And hopefully I don't need to introduce to people here what a ruminant is, but many of you mightn't um, know that ruminants really evolved um, it's almost over 50 million years ago. And some of the very first ruminants were actually these really small, um, rabbit-like creatures, you know, less than five um, um, kg. Since then, today, we've got about almost 200 uh, ruminant species exist on, on, our, on our planet. And when you look at population numbers, the wild population sits around 75 um, million. 
And we've actually gone on to, to domesticate out of those 200 uh, ruminant species, about nine of them um, in, in, into very large quantities. And in terms of our domesticated ruminant species, the population, it's sitting at a staggering, um, you know, over 3.5 um, billion. And my little pie graph or my pie chart there really shows, you know, the sort of makeup of those, um, of those species. And you see that cattle is our, our main ruminant species um, worldwide, followed by sheep. And, and goat. Um, they're obviously ruminants are fascinating. They have this ability to, you know, take, you know, you know, grass or forage that we humans can't eat. And because of the rumen, are able to convert that, um, that forage into, you know, a high quality protein that um, we humans like to eat and has, you know, very good nutritionally and also has, you know, really nice um, amino acids that we humans need um, in, in our actual diet. And that's why they've become so popular. When we think and look at the trends of what's been happening in ruminant numbers, here I'm just showing you some um, trends across decades from about the 1970s um, onwards and also broken it up, you know, across some of the major regions um, globally. And you can see in some parts of the world, you know, the expansion of ruminant numbers have been, you know, significant, particularly, you know, in, in Africa and Middle East and Asia and developing Pacific, you know, in the sheep and goats um, um, species. And then, in, for instance, in Latin America and Caribbean, we're looking at, you know, large um, cattle and uh, um, numbers, etc. So what's really driving that um, increase in ruminant numbers? Well, you know, if you break it down to sort of the simplest um, driver, it's really around human population and the demand for our lifestyle, our livestock um, products. You know, obviously the human population is, is increasing and with that increase comes, you know, an increased demand uh, for food and humans particularly really like um, uh, livestock um, products. And you know, there's no, there doesn't seem to be any let up in the demand for, for products such as meat and milk. Here I'm just showing you a simple um, um, data from some FAO work that are showing, you know, pretty much across all the, the, the regions or, or worldwide, you know, modeling out to 2050, the demand for products such as meat and milk are expected to, to increase. But on the flip side of that, you know, increased demand for, you know, for food and, 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 and the demand for ruminant products, we do know that uh, ruminants are a source of greenhouse um, um, gases. And really, when we think about uh, ruminants, there's two gases that we're talking about. We're talking about methane and we're talking about um, nitrous oxide. When I talk about ruminant and its main source of, of methane, it's really around what we call, you know, enteric fermentation. So this is where, for instance, the animal eats grass or plant material. That plant material goes down into the rumen of, this, of the animal. And we have a community of microbes that break down that plant material into smaller substances that the animal can use to generate its energy and its milk and meat. Some of the byproducts of that digestion process are unable to be used by the animal and instead get used by this unique group of microbes, which we call methanogens or methane forming microbes, which take some of those byproducts of digestion and convert it into methane, which then gets eructated or belched out by the animal. About 95% of the methane comes out the front end of the animal. We also do get uh, methane coming from our management of um, manure. But largely, um, when it comes to agricultural greenhouse gases, enteric fermentation is our main, is our key source uh, for methane emissions. Ruminants are also a source of nitrous oxide. Predominantly, you know, when they uh, urinate in terms of their urine patches, you know, there's nitrogen that's present in their urine, which then goes on to the paddock or, or the field. And these urine patches, you have microbes. Again, it's a microbial process in the soils, which takes some of that nitrogen that's present in the urine and convert it into nitrous oxide emissions, which then get emitted up into the atmosphere. What's happening when it comes to agricultural greenhouse gas emissions? Well, they're increasing. And the global consensus is that about 10 to 12% of all anthropo anthropogenic emissions are rise directly from agriculture. And about approximately 70% of these come from the livestock um, sector. You can see the breakdown of the agricultural emissions. And again, as I said, you know, enteric fermentation 
um, as well as you know uh, manure applied to soils etc and manure left on, on pasture are, are key sources um, for these agricultural emissions. When we think about mitigation in agriculture and we think about you know the climate targets that have been put forth under the Paris Agreement so obviously trying to keep uh, uh, rising temperatures to you know, 1.5 above pre-industrial times are, 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 are less than um, um, two degrees or well below two degrees. You know, in all of the modeled scenarios that scientists have done, you know, uh, they all require significant reductions in the agricultural greenhouse gases, methane and nitrous oxide. Work has been done by, uh, by various um, um, groups around, you know, what is the actual, um, potential in terms of mitigation and, and some really good work by Willenberg et al showed that about um, known practices could only deliver about somewhere between 21 to 40 percent of the needed reduction even if implemented fully at scale which really uh, highlights the, the challenge that we have in the agricultural sector around how we are going to reduce our greenhouse gases while at the same time satisfying the, the demand for, the, for, 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 for things such as our livestock products. When I think about um, mitigation, I tend to think about mitigation, you know, and I sort of group them in three, three large baskets, you know, which, you know, particularly applies to what we do here in New Zealand, but could apply equally um, um, globally. The first mitigation basket is really around, you know, practices and technologies that really increase animal productivity and farm efficiency. So think about things like better herd management, better pasture, better genetics, better health. Essentially, you're looking at thinking about producing, producing more or less or the same amount of food with less, with less animals. And any of those practices or technologies that help do that can help, can help towards mitigation um, in the agricultural space. The second uh, ba large basket where I, think to, where I tend to group mitigations is what I call additional technologies that directly uh, reduce emis emissions. And this is where much of my research has been uh, uh, for many years. So I'm thinking about things like methane vaccines, methane inhibitors, new low emission feeds, animal breeding for low emissions phenotype, technologies uh, like, like, like such. And then the, la the last sort of basket that I tend to um, think about in terms of mitigation is really it's really around, it's a little bit like an other, but it's really around policies. Here in New Zealand, for example, we've got water quality regular, regular, regulatories that we need to think about, which affects the type of farming that we do in particular areas in, in New Zealand. Of course, also now we have farmers thinking about moving towards low emitting land uses, so converting, thinking about mixed systems, converting some of their land into cropping or horticulture, um, in order for to build resilience in their business. But equally, of course, there's also, you know, quite a lot of farmers interested in converting their land into, for instance, forestry for carbon, for carbon farming. And so in situations like that, you're taking land away that could be used for livestock farming. And as a, re as a result, you have a lower emitting land use. So this is really around policies and land, land use um, change. So I think it's really clear that, you know, it's, you know, for the agricultural sector going forward, there, there, there are some real challenges that we're going to have to, to meet if we're going to, to, to continue to, to farm and to farm sustainably. But equally, alongside challenges, there's always um, opportunities. And I think this leads quite nicely into our presentations that we'll hear from um, um, today, from some of the researchers and the work that they're doing around um, mitigation, uh, ruminants and greenhouse um, gases. So. Um, with that, I will hand it back over to, to Hazel to kick off into our first um, presentation. Um, after each presentation that we hear, um, really happy to take you know, one to two questions um, if people would like to clarify anything from our speakers. Hopefully we have all of our speakers online um, um, today, but equally as well, if you would like to ask me a question, um, we're here. Please put, write your questions into the chat box or, or raise your hand and between hopefully myself and Hazel will be able to, to, to manage um, the questions. 
So with that, I'll hand it back over to you, Hazel, and I will stop um, sharing. Great, thank you so much, Sinead. So our first presenter will be Juan de Jesus Vargas Martinez, and he is from Colombia. So bear with me while I just start sharing his presentation. I know for Juan it's 3 a.m. in the morning, so he's done really well to be up <laughs> and with us right now. How's that, Sinead? Can you see it okay? Yes. Just put just put it to full screen, Hazel. All right. Hi everyone. Thank you for attending my presentation. My name is Juan Vargas. I'm from Colombia and I'm doing my PhD at the University of Florida with Dr. Nicolás Di Lorenzo. The host organization is the Instituto de Investigaciones Agropecuarias Senior from Chile and the leading of the project are Dr. Camilo. <laughs> This is my first year in my PhD program, so I will show you my proposal of my PhD project. The title of my proposal is Strategies to Mitigate Entering Methane Emission of Ruminants in Pastoral Systems. As an introduction, ruminants are essential component in grassland systems to provide ecosystem services. Ruminant is associated with greenhouse gas production and other environmental issues, especially enteric methane emission. Methane is a greenhouse gas uh, and also is an energy loss for ruminants. Lenk in 1993 suggested that 75% of the enteric methane come from ruminant on low quality diets. However, only 7% of the methane research has been conducted in grazing condition. For that reason, it is necessary to define strategies that promote greater animal production and reduce enteric methane emission in pastoral systems. My project is divided in three different phases. Initially, we are doing the we are collected and analyzed information related with practices to reduce methane emission in grassland systems. Also, we are planning to do a survey to producer and technician in different locations to evaluate and understand practices and limitations that they have in field condition. During the phase two, we are planning to evaluate three different strategies to reduce methane. Literature suggested that the fishing grass management to improve forage quality or the inclusion of forage with secondary compounds re could reduce methane emission. In this sense, we want to evaluate traditional versus improved forage, forage practices on backgrounding diets in beef cattle system. Also, literature suggested that the strategic supplementation as chemical inhibitor of methanogenesis or additives or feed supplements in the diet in ruminant diets could reduce methane emission. In this sense, trinitroxypropanol in dairy cows or essential oil in beef heifers could be supplemented to reduce methane. In the third strategy, we want to evaluate early feeding intervention through the supplementation during peripartum some, some additives. We want to evaluate to incorporate essential oil to dams to reduce and evaluate methane emission in offspring. With these results, we want to provide recommendations that promote greater technical adoption according to the producer limitation. Because our, our objective is to maintain or increase productivity, reduce enteric methane emission, and decrease overall feeding costs of pasture-based livestock system. The green one squares are all activities that we are planning with Dr. Munoz and Dr. Ugerfeld from India. Some take home message for you. Evidently, less research has been conducted on strategies to reduce methane emission in grassland systems. 
In this sense, we are required to do evaluation of feeding practice to increase animal efficiency and reduce methane emissions. Grass management and supplementation may be a strategy to decrease methane emission in pastoral system. Finally, adoption requires understand the limitations of the producers and the evaluation of technical and economical aspects of the selected technologies. Thank you for your attention, and if you have some questions, feel free to ask me. Uh, th thanks, Juan. Um, does anybody, would anybody like to ask one uh, question? Please feel free to, I think, can you raise your hand um, or on mute and um, ask your question? Don't be shy. Um, one, I guess while we're waiting, you know, you, one of the, you know, one of the things I'm quite interested, obviously, around feed and, and feed management is around extension. So it's around, you know, how do you take what you learn in the field and communicate it to the people that you would want to use uh, the practice that you're developing? Have you considered that in your research? Are you there, Juan? Yeah, we seem to have lost one who was, it might have been too early in the morning. Oh no, there he is. I'll just admit him. Oh. Okay, we have one in the call now. Yeah. No audio. Yeah, we'll just wait. Hi everybody, this is the, the fun and games of, of <laughs> working with Zoom nowadays our lives and international yeah bear bear with us please continue to introduce yourself in the chat i see lots of people um um chatting that's good one thank you oh here is one one thank you can you uh, one thank you very much for your presentation um i just had a question around obviously you know you're you're looking at developing you know you know practices that can be used from a on a pastoral you know grazing system is part of your work and I, I think when I looked at your presentation earlier was around you know extension and communicating to the people that would want to use those practices and stuff that you're developing is that factored into the research that you're doing yes actually in when I, I read some uh, uh, related with methane, I think that the big issue is the low adoption of uh, practices okay. to reduce methane. So part of my idea with my, my PhD uh, project is try to evaluate what is the limited factors or why uh, producers can adopt that, that technologies. Maybe this is... Um, uh, um, uh, one part of the project to understand why and try to develop some strategies to increase the adoption, especially related with economical aspects, because I think that this is the main constraint, but we need to evaluate in different conditions, the uh, different um, position of the farmers around that. Yeah. Ah, oh, that's that's brilliant. That's great to hear that you're incorporating that into into your research. Um, before we move on, is there? I'll give everybody. Is there any more questions for if, if one? If not, we'll um, um, thank one for his presentation, and and we'll come back. I think at the end we'll have a panel discussion. One, so hopefully you can stay on to to the end. Or Hazel, you're looking like there is a question. <laughs> there is a question actually. Sani yeah. has has a question, and I see you're unmuted, Sani. So please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Presenter. I think the presentation is a very wonderful one. But I thank just you. want uh, you to to be very specific in mentioning the kind of you know instrument that you are going to use to determine the entry entry emission. So, so that it is very clear the, you know, the methodology and the instrument specifically you are willing to use in your research. Thank you. Yes, thank you for your question. It's very important. Um, 
Actually, there is maybe two different uh, strategies to measure methane in grassland condition, a big green feed and SF6 technique. Uh, but uh, in this case, we will use SF6 technique and all developed in New Zealand and, and Australia methodology around that. And I think that this technique at least is a, a good uh, way to, to estimate methane emission in, in grassland condition. Yep. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for the question, Sani, and, and thank you, Juan, for that answer. Okay, I think with um, that, um, Hazel, would you like to move it on to the next um, presenter, please? Yes, um, and I've just seen a question come through from Florencia as well for ah. Juan. I wonder if we should just quickly ask. Oh, yes, absolutely. Go. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see what it is. So... Yeah, Floor has said, thank you for your presentation. And where would the targeted farmers be? I imagine the farmer profile in the United States and Chile may differ. Uh, yes, um, actually that is the idea. Um, we want to evaluate uh, in Colombia too. I'm from Colombia. So my idea is try to compare different um, level of intensification um, in, in uh, adoption of, of methane, uh, methane mitigation practices. So that is the idea to compare and evaluate what is the perception. And I think that maybe producers uh, have similar perception around methane. However, the, the approach to reduce methane could be different. But that is the idea, to compare and to evaluate different perception and try to understand and develop strategies in different contexts to reduce methane in pastoral system. Yeah. Um, thanks, thanks, Juan. I also see a question that's come in from Ortez, I think. So she's, the question she's asked is, what is the actual situation to use something like a vaccine and inhibitor in an extensive system, for example? in um, New Zealand. So yeah, in New Zealand, you know, it would, you know, something like, well, for a methane vaccine, you know, and obviously that's still in a phase of, of de development and is at least unless there's a major significant breakthrough, you know, at least 10 years, 10 years away before we would see a technology like that reach the market. But one of the things about a methane vaccine is something that you would probably inoculate uh, potentially when the the animal is born and it would um, generate lifelong um, um, immunity sort of against the, the methane forming um, microbes or that is the envisioned plan for a methane vaccine so that would be quite um, applicable to to grazing grazing systems is what we would call it in in New Zealand. The inhibitors are a little bit different. They're, you know, obviously the 3NOP was developed for the TMR um, system, which wouldn't be very relevant to, of course, in New Zealand where we have quite a lot of grazing um, systems. But, you know, uh, scientists are looking to develop slow release molecules, which uh, are slow release um, capsules or even consider bolus. Um, application, which might make it applic applicable, for instance, in New Zealand, we do have dairy farmers that would meet their animals, you know, if they're milking their animals twice a day. And so at that point, they would feed their animals the uh, something like an inhibitor um, technology. So, but obviously it wouldn't be um, applicable to, for instance, our beef and sheep would tend to be roaming on, on hillsides um, um, and so forth. So hopefully that's sort of answered your question. Um, Ortez, yeah. Okay. Over great. to you, Hazel. Yeah. Thanks, Sinead, and thanks, Juan, for that. That was great. Um, the next presenter that we have is Babak. I apologize if I pronounced your name incorrectly, Babak. I haven't met you yet in person. And Dara Bekane from Iran. So I will share my screen now. And. Hello everyone, my name is
is called by Florida Department from Iran. My colleague for us, us organization is Natural Resource Institute, Finland. The title of my presentation is Effects of Starch Level and Mixture of Sunflower and Fish Oils on Enteric Methane Emission in Dairy Cows. The growing human population is boosting the demand for milk and meat as a source of animal protein, resulting in several challenges for women in production system including the need to reduce their contribution of greenhouse gas emission. This calls for a special attention to solutions for reducing methane emission from ruminants without negative effect on productivity. A number of strategies, including management, genetics, and dietary approach, have been proposed for methane mitigation. In fact, chemical composition of the feed and changing the starch content of the concentrate has been proposed as a methane reducing strategy. On the other hand, fat supplementation is another feeding strategy which not only reduces methane production but can improve meat fatty acid composition with potential benefit to human health. Our proposal was that higher research level and oil supplementation would have additive effect on reducing ruminal methane production in dairy cows. Therefore, the present study aims to assess the effect of the starch level with or without mixture of sunflower and fish oils on milk yield and composition and ruminal methane emission in dairy cows. Latin square with a factorial arrangement of treatment was applied to four multiparous nerdic red cows in a new plantation. Each experimental period consisted of 14 days diet adaptation, five days as a sampling period, and then 16 days washed out to a white carryover effect to the next period. The cows were randomly allocated to the diets. Isometrician's diet were used based on grass silage, consisting of high starch or low starch levels with or without mixture of sunflower and fish oils. Cows were kept in an individual tire side, had free access to water. Your feed intake was measured by subtracting the results from the upper feed during days 14 to 17 of each experimental period. Milk samples were collected or written consecutive milking during days 15 to 19 of each experimental period, and ruminal methane emission were recorded over six days period by SF6 tracer technique. Dry matter intake did not differ between cows fed low starch and high starch diet, while oil supplementation rate is dry matter intakes. Milk yield were not influenced by dietary treatment. Inclusion of the oil mixture in low starch and high starch diets reduced daily ruminal methane emission. Cow receiving oil supplements had lower methane emission intensity calculated as a gram per kilogram milk and gram per kilogram ECM than their control counterparts. No difference was found between the treatment in a term of methane emission calculated as a proportion of cow's energy intake. The findings of this experiment show that feeding more starch originating from concentrate portion instead of fiber at a moderate level in dairy cow's diets does not favor lower methane production and oil supplementation is similarly effective on reducing methane in low and higher starch diet. The effect of increasing dietary starch level and oil supplementation on methane emission was not additive. Thank you for listening. Thank you um, for that. Do we have a get online? Baba, are you able to unmute yourself? Let's see. 
I have had a message from the back saying that he does have a, a quite a bit of background noise at the moment. Uh, okay, so um, it looks like Bobek is not able to unmute at the moment. So, um, I, yes, I do see that, Titus, you have a question for Babak. So you're welcome to voice your question and perhaps uh, Babak, he can respond in the chat box if he's unable to unmute himself. Yeah, that sounds like a, that sounds like a good compromise, I think, mm -hmm. as well. Um, so unfortunately, sorry everybody. Um, as always, it's it's hard to get um, it all working correctly um, with so many people from various different um, corners of, of of the globe. So um, we might move on to the next presentation. And if you've got any questions for Babak, maybe you can put it in the as Hazel said, put it in the um, chat, and um, um, he can answer from from there. So we'll move on to the next uh, presentation now, Hazel. Our uh, next uh, presenter is Mohamed Arawolo from Nigeria. Bear with me while I share my screen again. My name is Mohamed Adebayo Arawolo. I'm in Nigeria. So I'm doing my PhD study in China. My host organization and country is Institute of Agricultural Research, Sri Lanka, Chile. My PhD, my PhD title is The Influence of Women Physiological Environments on Fermentation, Dissolved Gases and Methane Production. Before I proceed, I'd like to state that this area of study is very wide and because of the time limits of this presentation, I will restrict myself to just only one part of the study. The general overview of the objectives. Luminal gases, that is hydrogen gas, carbon dioxide, and methane are mainly produced during carbohydrate fermentation to volatile fatty acids. Then these luminal gases exist in two forms, dissolved gases in the liquid and gaseous from which are always in the air space of the rumen. Rumen dissolved gases are supersaturated according to 1 et al. 2016. And saturation factor determines or controls the evolution rate of dissolved gases into the rumen air space and thus may affect the entire gas emission. Several few studies have been, have been performed to, to determine the factors that can affect rumen dissolved gases, saturation factor, and gas emissions. So in 2TV, saturation factor can be influenced by physical factors such as motility of reticular rumen, as reticular rumen contractions are mainly associated with intense missing of digester, exchanging gases between airspace and liquid phase, and gas eruption. Dietary foreign particle size alters growing activities which can influence the motility of the woman by stimulating the woman wall. Greater chewing activity may also increase saliva production with greater bicarbonate concentration in the ruminal fluid. And this also can influence the fermentation process and methanogenesis. Therefore, the objective of this study was to investigate the effect of forage particle size on rumen gases and evolution of these rumen gases. Then we hypothesized that increasing forage theoretical cut lengths would alter the distribution of the forage particle sizes which could affect chewing activity, gases production and emission in goods. This research was carried out at the Institute of Subtropical Agriculture, Chinese Academy of Sciences, Changsha, China, and varied forage particle sizes were initiated by cutting forage into two forage theoretical cut lengths of 20 mm and 100 mm. After the distribution, we realized that both 
treatments are the same physical effective NDF. So 10 male goats with body weight of 37 were random, randomly assigned to either one of the two dietary treatments in a crossover design. Then the chewing activity, the nutrient digestibility, measurements of enteric methane and carbon dioxide emission, rumen sampling and sample analysis were all carried out in this experiment. The summary of the results. Increasing quality CL increased time spent for eating, rumination, and chewing in terms of second about. Increasing forage TCL did not alter the apparent nutrient digestibility in goats. Increasing forage TCL did not alter rumen pH, though it tended to increase the acetate to propionate ratio and decreased ammonia nitrogen. The sample time greatly affected dissolved hydrogen and dissolved carbon dioxide concentration. Also, gas and uh, airspace hydrogen and headspace methane concentrations were also affected by the sample time. But increasing for ATCL did not alter dissolved gases in the liquid phase and in the airspace of grooming, and it tended to decrease the saturation factor of hydrogen. Increasing forage TCL did not, did not alter enteric methane and carbon dioxide emissions. Conclusions. In some way, although increasing forage TCL greatly altered distribution of forage particle size, both forages show the same PENDF content which explained the similar nutrient digestibility and BFA profile in goats. Increasing for ATC altered chewing activity with increased eating and rumination activities, which could alter the motility of the rumen. However, such changes in chewing activity had little impact on rumen dissolved gases, saturation factor, and gases emissions. Thank you all for listening. Great. Thank you, Abraham, for that. That was, was ec excellent. Does anybody have a question for um, Abraham and his um, presentation? Um, while we're waiting, I might um, kick off. I'm actually... Um, Obviously, you've shown, you know, uh, all results are good results in, in science, but where to next, Abraham, actually, with, in your uh, hypothesis and, and your work? Oh, can you hear me? Oh, sorry. Is it, Mo is it, Mo oh, it's Mohammed. Mohammed. Oh, oh, sorry, yeah. Mohammed. Uh, apologies. Yeah, okay. Apologies for that. So if you, I'll just repeat my question. I'm, you know, obviously um, the results didn't go as you expected. So what is your hypothesis going forward or what's the next phase in your research? So the, the next phase that, um, because of the result of this first experiment, so we decided to use uh, room simulation technology because there are so many factors that we can control in vivo. So, but with the rumen sim simulation technology, I think we can actually isolate these factors because we know that the uh, physiological responses to PENDF in ruminants is number one, the rumen motility, the secondly, buffer dilution rate or the inflow of saliva into the rumen. So we wanted to we want to isolate these factors and see the effects on on the rumen fermentation, most especially the dissolved gases, because it controls the I mean this is the saturation factor of the dissolved gases because it controls the 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 evolution of these gases and probably the subsequent emission into the atmosphere. So by doing that, we will we will um, isolate it using uh, Roman's simulation technology by varying the motility 
and every other factor will remain constant. Okay. So from there, we will now proceed to varying the dilution rate of the buffer into the rumen and also look at, because the significance of this study is to, because uh, it is, um, okay, let me put it in this short form, that passage rate of fee in the rumen is al always overshadow every other factor because we believe that the faster the passage rate of feed in the rumen, the lesser the degradation of fermentation process, which reduce methane emission in ruminants. So, because of this technology that was developed in our lab, when one it in one in I think 2016 wanted to compare or wanted to um, uh, compare this um, Henry Henry's law of equilibrium of the two gases, that is gas in the air space and the gas in the, in the dissolved form. I, I'm mixing this thing up. Okay. Yeah. No. <laughs> let, me, let me, okay, the significance of this study is, is the one technology was developed in the lab, which made us assume that physical factor in the, in, can affect the evolution rate of dissolved gases and subsequent in, in, in methane emission in ruminants. So instead of this fact to be overshadowed by the effect of faster passage rate in the rumen. Yep. Oh, oh, I made sense now. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, 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 yeah, I just, absolutely. Passage rate is, 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 is key, um, is a key, is a key quality. So it's great that you're, you're, you're thinking, you're thinking about that. Um, there is a question, a question here from Adnan. I hope I'm pronouncing people's names correctly, but, um, and he was one, or he or she was wondering, is there any side effects if we, for instance, or have you considered any side effects if you made silage from forage and what, what that might mean? Um, you know, to, to the balances that you were talking about, uh, Mohammed. If we try to be silent from forages, right? Yes. I, I think the only effect is the nutritional composition of the type of forage. The, the nutritional composition of the forage that we use for the silage. I think that's the only, only effect that that one could uh, depending on the type of forage that one yeah anybody wants to use to, to make the silage i guess yeah how it would affect for uh, the passage rate as well of course if it's you know sort of chopped up silages as well which might make a difference to what you were um talking about um we did also have one um question from sunny you had your hand raised before i'm not sure if you'd like to ask your question now Are you there, Sunny? Still? Huh. Thank you, Mr. Presenter. This is a very interesting one. I really appreciate it, especially the conclusion part of the work. Uh, mine is in your introduction statement. You made mention that uh, because of the time factor, you couldn't be able to explain the other part of the research. But I would just like you to list out the other you know, area of focus of the research so that we know the, you know, the total scope of your research. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. I, I, I actually made mention of it, but when we saw the result of the first experiment, which was in the room, we, during the experiment, we realized that there are so many factors that we couldn't control in, in live animals. So we decided to go ahead and use rumens in simulation technology. We have a continuous system in our lab so in which we will vary the, the motility level because as we know, PENDF, different PENDF will initiate rumen motility in different ways. Like small particle sizes of feed we reduce rumen motility. Why um, large particle size will initiate it more than the small 
particle size. So that is why we decided to to um, vary the rumen, I mean the maturity level in rumen sim in simulation system. And then second, the second, I mean the third part of the experiment is varying the rumen dilution rate, the rate at which saliva will flow in a normal natural environment into the rumen. So we replicated that, we simulated that in this system and to see the effect on rumen dissolved gases. Hope I answered the question. Yes, very comprehensively. Um, Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Annie, for the question, and thanks, uh, Mohammed, for your um, presentation, and also asking, uh, answering all those uh, questions really comprehensively. That's um, that's fantastic. Um, all right, Hazel, I guess we'll move on to the next uh, uh, presentation, please. Thank you. We can do that. So the next presenter is Abraham um, Fayessa from Ethiopia. Hello, this is uh, Abraham Abra Faisa, one of the third round recipients of uh, Cliff Grad from Ethiopia. Uh, on behalf of this, I would like to thank you for uh, providing me this opportunity at the same time to be part of this special session. My host and uh, institution is Bureau of Animal Husbandry and Genetic Improvement, Department of Livestock Development, Thailand. This is my uh, dissertation title. These are the presentation outline. Uh, when I come to the general overview, the process of anthropogenic global warming shows no sign of a uh, decreasing trend and is expected to bring about long-term change in weather condition. To date, the contribution of greenhouse gas emission from animal agriculture is becoming an issue regarding anthropogenic global warming because the livestock supply chain is a significant source of global greenhouse gas emissions. Conversely, animal agriculture is the most vulnerable sector to climate change and practice due to its high dependence on natural factors. And also, it is uh, projected that uh, the demand for livestock product is expected to double by 2015 because of the population growth, urbanization, and the diet up upgrade. So, the global livestock production is at the crossroad of reducing greenhouse gas emission enhancing the adaptive capacity or reducing vulnerability while also help to attain the growing demand for livestock products. Owing to the above premise, the issue of climate smart livestock farming is unquestionable for the country having huge number of livestock and distinct a diverse production system. So far, however, there has been limited information about the environmental footprints of animal agriculture particularly the contribution of Ethiopian dairy sector to global greenhouse gas emission. Therefore, this study is intended to address the following specific objective. The first one, to examine environmental impacts of dairy value chain by using life cycle assessment. Second, to estimate country specific emission factor for enteric methane emission from dairy cattle. The fourth is the third, to assess farmers perception and decision to adopt climate smart dairy far farming practice in relation with uh, knowledge, attitude, and uh, practice of climate smart livestock uh, farming. And the last one is to examine the effects of climate smart dairy farming practice on farmers' food security. Uh, when I come to the methodology and the study area description, the study area will be conducted in the central highlands of Ethiopia from a regional state at the South of which is known uh, to have around 16% of the total livestock population in Ethiopia. This area I also believed to cover 40% of the area of the country, being the largest of their kind in sub-Saharan Africa. These are uh, the bio biophysical features of uh, the study area. Uh, when it comes to research design, uh, it is a mixed research uh, uh, approach, which, which include quantitative and qualitative research approach. These are the sampling techniques, the zone, district, and uh, PAs are uh, uh, purposively uh, and randomly selected for the purpose to attain the, uh, my objective. 
and also source of data and the collections also uh, going to be conducted by following uh, those uh, uh, procedure uh, and also data analysis is going to be uh, takes place by dividing my objective into two uh, the first objective is going to be uh, uh, used by the following lim i fcc to tier 2 and anova is going to be used and then the social economic data are going to be analyzed by using descriptive statistics econometric mo models especially uh, switching regression model and original switching regression model is going to be used to see the effects of climate smart livestock production on farmers food uh, security uh, food consumption scoring and household diet dietary diversity is also going to be used to uh, uh, analyze household food security these are uh, my uh, study in the expected uh, study output especially relation to uh, the policy uh, uh, of the country or the policy contribution uh, it will provide useful empirical information to policy makers researchers academicians and other stakeholders regarding environmental footprints of animal agriculture and also it will be vital to produce baseline information and identify hotspot areas across the value chain and predict mitigation scenarios of greenhouse gas emission and also can assist policymakers to target and design efforts to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions and lastly it's indicate factors affecting uh, farmers adoption decision and the challenge to adopt climate smart uh, practice uh, these are all about thank you so much for your uh, attention and then you are also welcome with uh, question and constructive comment thank you so much great now i can see that abraham is not on the call so Sinead, as you suggested, perhaps we just move on to the next speaker. Yeah, that's, that sounds good. I think if there is any questions that people have for um, Abraham, it's probably technical difficulties, please put them in the, the chat and then we can always send them to um, Abraham to be asked maybe via email if, if required. So um, as you said, Hazel, let's move on to the next presentation. Right, so the next presenter is Bulelane Papita and she's from South Africa. So hopefully. Good morning, everyone. Okay. My name is Bulelani Nangam Sopepeta from South Africa. Today I'll be presenting to you my research progress. Uh, under the title of the research, uh, assessing the effect of exogenous acetate supply on methane emission and milk production in dairy cows at animal level. The general overview of the study is as follows. Ruminants are a major contributor to anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions and animals raised on tropical rangelands have a significant higher greenhouse gas footprint due to the poor quality of refugees consumed by these animals. Refugees in rangelands are inherently low in crude protein, minerals, while high in fiber content. This does not only affect feed intake and digestibility, but it also contributes to greenhouse gas emissions. These greenhouse gas emissions include carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrogen oxide, to name but a few. During the normal fermentation processes in the rumen, there are two microbial species in the rumen which are perceived to obligatory utilize metabolic hydrogen from end products of substrate fermentation via methanogens or homoacetogens. Uh, whether the processes that are going to be used to utilize metabolic uh, hydrogen are going to be via methanogens or homoacetogens depends on a variety of complex uh, number of factors which are extensively reviewed somewhere. On the other hand, acetate provides approximately 45% of the total energy 
from the utilization of short chain fatty acids and previously short term uh, exogenous infusions increases energy partition about 35% towards milk synthesis as reported by Eurasia et al. 2019. Strategies that redirect the feed energy loss due to methane formation to other substrates that are useful to the host animal and which become available in the production would likely have higher adoption by farmers. Research objectives, methods and results. The first objective of the study is to assess the effect of exogenous acetate supply on methane emission in dairy cows. And the data required to achieve this objective will be um, methane and SF6. The analytical tool will be mixed model uh, procedures of cells. The second objective will be to assess the effect of exogenous acetate supply on milk yield in dairy cows. And data required to achieve this will be milk yield, which will be analyzed via the mixed model procedures of cells. The last objective will be to assess the effect of exogenous acetate supply on milk components in dairy cows. Milk samples from the morning and afternoon milking will be collected for analysis to achieve this objective, while the analytical tool to be used will be the mixed model procedures of cells. The study will be conducted uh, in Inia, Remechi Osono, in Chile, uh, with the following geological uh, coordinates above the sea level as reported by Munoz et al. 2019. The expected results is the establishment of the use of acetate as a strategy aimed at improving milk yield in dairy cows followed by the establishment of the use of acetate as a strategy aimed at improving milk fat content in dairy cows. And lastly, maintained or minimal reduction of methane in response to reduced pH in relation to external su supply of acetate in dairy cows. In conclusion, globally, dairy production is an important and common farming practice as it alleviates poverty through job and income creation. Lastly, formulating sustainable feeding practices aimed at improving feed efficiency through improved milk production while reducing carbon footprint is an imperative uh, approach for adoption by farmers. Thank you for listening. Um, so is Bulalani on online? I cannot see Bulalani online, although there is a, a random phone number, so perhaps that's Bulalani? Maybe not. Oh, that's a real shame because um, I was really interested in asking some questions um, on the thermodynamics, particularly in their hypothesis around that, but maybe we can ask that via, via, via email. So how are we doing, um, Hazel, with the presentations? Is there another one to go? No, that's all five presentations. Oh, fantastic. Um, well, that's been um, um, really um, great. Does anybody have any questions to any of the presenters that are online at the moment? Uh, please uh, ask them in the, in, in the chat. Um, I guess one of the questions, I guess the GRA secretariat and, and even myself are interested to, to people who have been uh, presented today, I'd be quite interested in hearing, you know, how you felt the Cliff Grad scheme has really benefited um, your research. So maybe I could um, go back to some of our speakers that have spoken today, you know, Mohammed, I think you were online. One, you were online as well. Uh, would you be able to give a comment on that? Yes, um, I think that this possibility to do, um, to share information and to share different point of view with Cliff's grants is a good opportunity because um, we can the possibility 
to do research in different groups and um, understand and learn uh, different approaches. So that is important. Uh, in my case, for example, with Dr. Camila Muñoz and Emilio Uger from INEA, I have the possibility to, um, to do some of my research in, with, with uh, their jobs with their research. Uh, and I think that is very um, pertinent to do this kind of um, a al alliance between different groups. So for that reason, it's, it's a good opportunity to have this, this class. Yeah. Thank, and whereabouts are you? Well, whereabouts are you in your uh, research? You know, uh, you know, one, and you know, are you, you know, almost finished your PhD in the midst of your PhD, starting your PhD, and no, you know, where to next? This is my. I start uh, this my second year. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So um, with Dr. Camila Muñoz and Emilio Ugerfeld, uh, we are doing um, a review and document and article review with different um, strategies to reduce methane in grassland systems. So I think that is the very good first step in, in these kind of projects. Perfect. Uh, but we want to continue this kind of collaboration for future, for future um, uh, activities. So it's a good opportunity to, to, for that reason, it's a good opportunity to have this kind of um, interaction with different groups. Oh, brilliant. Oh, well, thank you very much for that answer, uh, Juan. Um, Mohamed, um, what, about, what about you? What, what are the sort of um, benefits that you've seen from using the, or from being a part of the Cliff, the Cliff Grads um, um, scheme and, and where to next for you and your research? Hey, um, <clears throat> actually, I, I was supposed to have gone for the training at the beginning of this year, but because mm. of this uh, COVID-19 situation. Yeah. But I know that I will benefit a lot from, from it because uh, I've met with Dr. Emilio personally when he visited our research lab in China. He contributed to my research, ongoing research, and also he, we discussed about this uh, study or research that he, he wanted to start in his own lab too, and I was greatly uh, interested in it. So when this opportunity of Cliff Grads came on and I saw the same project we discussed, so I decided to apply. Unfortunately, I, I got the grant, so I know how it will greatly benefit studying with him on, on, on his project. Cool. Thanks, thanks, Mohamed. And um, there's a question there from, from Sani for you on the chat, which is, he's really asking, he said, I would like to ask Mohamed about his research challenge and also, um, and puts it out to the other presenters about expected challenge or limitations associated with their proposed uh, work. So where do you see the challenges, um, um, Mohamed, um, you know, going forward? Okay, um, let me say in short that I've overcome most of the challenges I faced when I joined the research team in, in China because it was very strange to me coming from my background. And um, before I could blend into this kind of challenge, it took me a very long time. And with the help of my tutor in, in China, I was able to, to overcome that. Then on the research, I would say, because this, to me, this line of research is very in interesting. And uh, I would say some of the challenges that we face are the things that I mentioned earlier, that there are some factors that we couldn't control. I wish we could control those factors in, in vivo because that is how we can actually separate the 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 issue i mean the effects of passing rates of feed in the room and on other factors that also occur in line with it so but 
the rooming, rooming simulation system that we're using, you know, we can't compare it. it it's not 100% like in vivo, but it's just for us to have an idea of what would, could happen if we can control the passive rate of feed. Yeah. Let's go. Cool. So, th th thanks, Mohammed. Uh, one, what about you? That was it. Was also addressed to the other the other um, presenters who, are who are available. What What do you see your challenges um, going going forward with your research? Mm, I think that coronavirus is, it, it was a very difficult situation. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, we expected to visit uh, Chile this year, but we can't. I can't. For coronavirus situation, and uh, that is, um, uh, and I don't know how we'll develop this situation in the in the near future. Um, yeah. So that is a very a very important challenge. Technically, um, for us, methane emission in, gra in in grassland condition in pastoral condition is a very big challenge because yeah. there is an there is not a lot of um, technical uh, technologies to measure methane in grassland condition. And also, I think that uh, adoption is a very important challenge for, for, for us because uh, if we want to, to uh, the primary sector to producers can um, increase the efficiency and reduce methane, we need to understand the limitation and try to generate more appropriate technologies to improve the adoption. So um, I think that that is that yes. it. So, some really good points there, uh, one where, you know, we, in New Zealand, obviously, we are a grazing um, system. We graze our animals out on the grass 365 days um, a year. And interestingly, um, just a bit of snippet, we did a, a survey, uh, the government did a survey about how, you know, did farmers know, um, you know, how much emissions they were estimated to be coming from their farm and um, only 2% of farmers in New Zealand actually knew their, knew their number, which, um, you know, um, you know, sort of highlights the extent when it comes to, you know, the extension and ad adoption of, um, of technologies um, going, going forward. And we have a big um, push here in New Zealand to try and make our farmers aware of, of um, what greenhouse gases are and what, where, you know, and to make them aware of in terms of the sources and sinks of greenhouse gases on their, their farms. So certainly um, when I see Flor Florencia had also mentioned, you know, a really good comment that uh, she was pleasantly surprised to hear a couple of the presenters today um, really, really um, thinking about adoption and how the work that they're doing could be actually implemented um, out on the field, because that's eventually where these technologies have to um, to have to go. Um, so um, I think looking, I'm not sure, um, Hazel, you've been monitoring the chat. Is there any more questions um, coming up? I, I see Babek has been able to answer. If you look on the chat, he's been able to answer a few of the questions that have been um, raised. Is there anything more that I'm missing on that chat function? I was on mute. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Junaid. Yeah, just the one question from Sarah Valencia, a question for Babak, who um, I've just asked you to unmute Babak, but I, I believe you probably still don't have a good internet connection. Um, were calculated animals used for the ESF6 tracer experiment? Can this affect methane measurements with the tracer technique? Um, so perhaps, Babak, if you are able to either answer that via the chat or I can connect you and Sarah after the phone call. Um, there's actually another one just come through from Sarah. Did you measure volatile fatty acids in your experiment? Oh, thanks, Hazel. And I saw as well a great question but from you, one I, one I was also interested as well, particularly for maybe we can get to Bulalani around, you know, what was his hypothesis around acetate supply on methane mitigation? It's a pity he isn't here because I think that would, it would have been really interesting to, to hear their hypothesis there. It's a great question. Um, there as well. Now I don't know if um, 
we I think the GRA secretary mentioned that uh, we might have a a uh, Cliff Grads host on the line, uh, Maria I think from Argentina. Um, if I've got the correct country, I don't know if you want to um, unmute and and uh, have some comments around uh, the advantages uh, you feel you're going to get from or have got from from being a part of the Cliff Grads um, scheme. I'm not sure if Maria's audio is connected, actually. Ah, okay. Right. Oh, that's a shame. Otherwise, we do have Aaron on the call as well from New Zealand. I'm not sure if you had any, any comments about um, your research and, and why you're looking forward to hosting a Cliff grad student. Okay. See if I can find a meet button. Uh, <laughs> <right>. <laughs> hi, hi, AJ. Um, thanks, thanks for thanks for coming online. For me, uh, it's just always good to have people from outside uh, to come with uh, new ideas and different perspectives. So, uh, and uh, giving opportunity to young people uh, to learn more about greenhouse gas emissions, and hopefully for us as well to to learn some things about different systems. Uh, obviously in New Zealand, uh, we have intensive grazing systems, uh, but uh, it's good to learn things about more extent extensive systems and uh, systems uh, of different climates, especially since we might be moving ourselves to a different climate as well. So the also opportunities to learn uh, things for us. So first, yep, great opportunity to meet new people and from different countries. Brilliant. Thanks, thanks, AJ. That's that's awesome. Well, I think we're coming up probably on um, um, t time. Um, oh, I've seen a great question here by I Titus, which um, is: Do you consider the trade-off between methane and N two O? due to, to mitigation strategies. Absolutely, I think that's one of the th things we found over the evolution of looking at uh, or thinking about uh, technologies when it comes to you know, implementation out on farm. Often at the science level, we tend to focus in a basket. So you're looking at methane or you're researching nitrous oxide. But actually, of course, when, when you start to move these technologies out to, onto a farm, you really have to think about the on-farm, you know, system and the, you know, the integrated farm system. You know, you know, the prime example in New Zealand, I guess, is often, you know, used, for instance, you know, feed pads. So you think bringing the animals off onto a feed pad for, for a time, you know, will, will, will help you, um, you know, control your nitrous oxide emissions. But often when you bring your animals onto a feed pad, they tend to eat more. Uh, which means then, of course, you know, because, of course, the amount that you eat is very much related to how much methane you produce. So they're obviously eating more, producing more methane. And so you have a trade off here. And so these are things that really before you even go near to 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 application on a farm, um, you need to consider, as as uh, Titus says, rightly, that the the trade off between um, methane and nitrous um, oxide and a lot of the research that we do here in New Zealand and, and recommending going forward is that you do um, sort of think about, um, you know, even when you think about a low emissions feed, if we feed this particular uh, type, it might reduce methane, but it could actually re increase um, urine or, or nitrogen in the urine and as a result increase your nitrous oxide. So these are the things you have to start thinking about and you see more and more people really starting to think about um, that when they're considering an actual technology that will be applicable on, on, on farm in a practical um, sense. So hopefully, um, Titus, that's helped answer um, your um, um, question. So any more questions, uh, Hazel? As you're, I'm scanning the chat at the, at the same time to keep, to keep up to, to date, but Hazel is, is helping here. So I'll let you jump in there if there's anything. I haven't seen anything else that's um, 
it's come through while you've been talking to oh, me. Oh, okay, brilliant. So I think, you know, we've been here, you know, um, over an hour and a half. It's been really, really um, informative. I've, um, I'm delighted and, and really honoured that the GRA Secretariat has asked me to help um, chair this session. I've really enjoyed listening to everybody that's spoken and also uh, monitoring the chat and the great questions that uh, people are putting um, forward. It looks like the Cliff Grad scheme is, you know, it's such a nice bunch of people um, and it looks like you've got a really great um, atmosphere going. So I hope that um, continues. I'd like to thank Hazel for um, looking after all of the technical details and helping facil help facilitate um, this session and finally of course thank you to all of the speakers and thanks again to all of the audience members um, for coming online taking time out of your day to come and ask um, questions we we really really appreciate it and i'll hand it back to hazel i think to have the last uh, word thanks everybody and it's time for bed here in new zealand so um it's probably other people are starting the day for but for me it's it, good night and and thank you for such a great session Thank you so much, Sinead, for being such a wonderful chair and sharing your expertise with us. Um, like you mentioned, there is really a great atmosphere in the grads group, and I'm sure all of the students um, would appreciate me saying how much they are grateful for the knowledge that you share and this network, how everyone can connect. So yeah, thank you to all of the participants for joining and all of the hosts as well for joining this session. It's really, really great. And I look forward to seeing you all in the next session in one week's time, um, which is on global agricultural production and emission trends. And that's Dr. Uh, John Professor Corder. So without further ado, everyone have a wonderful uh, day or evening, or I know for one, we'll probably potentially go back to bed <laughs> since it was very early. So thank you everyone so much for joining and yeah, have a, have a wonderful day. <laughs> Bye.